I'm Laura London, and this is a special video edition of Speaking of Young, and the last one with this camera. Joining us today for episode 131 is Professor Paul Bishop at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. He studied at Magdalen College, Oxford University, where he was a doctoral candidate in the Faculty of Modern Languages and spent a year as the Lady Julia Henry Fellow at Harvard. He earned his PhD from Oxford in 1994 with the dissertation C.G. Jung's Reception of Friedrich Nietzsche, which was later published as the book The Dionysian Self. For 12 years, he held the position of Professor of German at the University of Glasgow, where he was involved with language and literature course design and delivery, research, writing, and international speaking. In 2013, he was named the William Jacks Chair in Modern Languages at the University's School of Modern Languages and Cultures. He underwent internal coach training, received a diploma in translation, and was elected a fellow of the Institute of Linguistics. Professor Bishop has worked widely on different aspects of analytical psychology and its place in intellectual history. His books examine the history of ideas with an emphasis on Jung, Nietzsche, and Ludwig Klages. He is the editor of numerous volumes, including Jung in Contexts, The Persistence of Myth, a Symbolic Form, A Companion to Goethe's Faust, and The Descent of the Soul in the Archaic. He is the author of more books than I could possibly name. They include Jung's Answer to Job, Nietzsche's The Antichrist, the two-volume series Analytical Psychology and German Classical Aesthetics, and his latest, Reading Plato Through Jung, Why Must the Third Become the Fourth? In 2020, he presented the Zurich Lecture Series Reading Goethe at Midlife, Ancient Wisdom, Greek Classicism, and Jung at the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich. And in 2022, he presented his essay, The Red Book and Other Searchers for the Soul, at the Eranos Conference, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul in the 21st Century, published as Volume 5 in the book series by Chiron. Professor Bishop is a former member of the Advisory Board of Spring, Journal of Archetype and Culture, and is currently on the editorial board of the International Journal of Jungian Studies and the Special Advisory Board of the Journal of Analytical Psychology. Today's episode is made possible by Temenos Dream, the revolutionary new dream tracking app available for iOS and Android. Now you can record your dreams by speaking into your phone or typing them into the app. Keep your dreams organized, search the built-in symbol dictionary, and have AI illustrate and interpret your dreams, all within the app. You can help support Speaking of Jung simply by downloading the app and creating a free account today, and by telling your friends to as well. By clicking on the link in the description box below, or on our website, speakingofjung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This video interview is being recorded on Wednesday, January 10th, 2024, through the magic of StreamYard. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, Professor Bishop. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Laura. Please call me Paul. Uh, very happy new year to you and, um, and all your, your listeners and viewers as well. Thank you. So we are here today to talk about your work and which I find fascinating. And I wanted to invite you uh, to be a guest here on Speaking of Jung, where I usually interview Jungian analysts. And you are something a little different. But so you see Jung through a different lens and from a different angle. And I am very interested in that. Because I've been interviewing analysts for over eight years now, and I mean, some, some aren't analysts, but your work with Jung is fascinating to me. And the fact that you find Jung fascinating is of interest to me. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your interest in, uh, in, in my work. I, I appreciate that as, as someone who is 
um, outside the analytical community in the in, in the strictest strictest sense, um, I, I do welcome that that interest uh, and, and that interchange. And and I think that's something which has has definitely helped me um, uh, over the past few years when when I've been working in the way that you've been you've been talking about um, is that um, I've always appreciated the fact that analysts take an interest in what academics do. Not always the other way around. Yeah. I don't think that academics are always quite as open to to, to the stuff that that analysts are, are, are doing, and, and and that's shame. And but uh, well, at least I don't fall into that category. I hope. So let's start at the beginning. How did you, a professor of German, right? You you worked as a professor of German. How did you find Jung, become interested in Jung, and begin writing about Jung? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it was some time ago now, wasn't it, when I when I think about it. Um, uh, I, I studied um, uh, French and German, and um, it was really through uh, through my German studies that I, that, that I came across uh, Jung, obviously as someone who writes uh, in, uh, in German, um, and who was part of that whole kind of, um, you know, modern European intellectual history, Freud, Marx, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but what intrigued me about Jung, and, and still does, is the fact that he is neglected within the academy, yeah. um, occluded, pushed to, uh, pushed to the side. Um, in fact, in some respects, I think that's, that's got worse as time has, as time has gone on. Um, and, and the same thing happens with people who are interested in, in Jung, like Hermann Hesse, for example, the novelist Hermann Hesse, um, who um, writes such beautiful books, wonderful novels. Damien is, is the classic Jungian novel. It's, it's full of all sorts of mm. Jungian symbolism, not surprisingly, because Hesse himself was undergoing a Jungian analysis. So, you know, the, the links there are very clear. Um, and a good example of an intellectual figure that Germanists don't like is Jung, and a good example of a novelist whom Germanists don't like is Hermann Hesse. So there's a kind of pattern that's going on there, and um, I still find it curious how, how few Germanists take Jung seriously. I really don't understand what they're on about. I, I've heard you mention in a talk that you have a bit of a soft spot for the underdog. And for thinkers who are overlooked or misunderstood or misrepresented or undeserved, undeservedly marginalized. And so you would say Jung is among them. Certainly as far as the academy is concerned and as far as his, his, his academic reception uh, to, today uh, is concerned, um, he, 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 the name of Jung is not a good name. Uh, that goes down well in um, academic discussions in the arts and humanities. Um, and I think that's the shame. And of course, at the moment, the arts and humanities in the West, generally speaking, certainly in the UK, um, are, how should we say, in a difficult phase. I mean, people talk about the crisis of the arts and, and humanities, people talk about students, uh, student figures dropping, um, they're being less interested mm. in it in the, in, in the media and, uh, and so on. Um, and Jung might be someone who could actually help the academy because yeah. as I think that, that Jung is a profoundly mm. academic thinker, not an un unproblematic one, but but then nobody ever is. Um, and this doesn't have to be, I'm 100% behind everything that Jung says in his 20 volumes. What I'm simply trying to point out is fact, the 20 volumes are there, more volumes coming out, of course, with the seminars through the, through the Philemon series and yeah. so on more letters to be uh, to be looked at we've now got the red book we've now got the black books it's a fascinating time in young in, in young studies um and what i really want to do is to try and share that enthusiasm that i have the the interest in this material that's there with people who are who are in the arts and humanities and to try and build bridges between the academy and the analytic world as well as we've been mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. so i have a couple of questions uh do you see that just in the UK, or do you see that in the US as well, or globally? Yeah, um, I think I think it's particularly the case in in the UK, okay. where uh, where psychoanalysis as a as a discipline and and as a culture is probably much more circumscribed, much more much more limited. We're much less 
that maybe the British are much less happy talking themselves talking about themselves. Mm. I don't I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's certainly not the case. Whenever you go to Germany or you go to Switzerland and you, you walk around a town or a city and and and, and you look at the uh, the nameplates that are up on doors, mm. there are an awful lot of psychoanalysts which are which are there. Um, and I think that the psychoanalytic community is in the United States. Well, everything's bigger in the United States, but right. um, uh, you've got a bigger pool there. I think within within the UK there is a certain antipathy towards uh, towards German thinkers, German thought uh, more generally, and and Germanists really ought to, in my view, combat that a bit more. It's not being for or against the, the people that you're uh, that you're trying to promote. It's saying there's there's material here that's of value. It's something worthwhile spending your time with. Um, and if, if people disagree, well, that, that's absolutely fine. But very often I find that they, that they disagree on the basis of reputation, smear, you know, the kind of familiar things that are thrown up about, about Jung. And that's not to say that there isn't stuff to be criticized, but, but let's have an adult and critical debate about it rather than just throwing around insults and smears, you know, the kind of thing I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So you referenced Jung or mentioned Jung as an academic thinker. And for me, he's a psychologist. He started as a psychiatrist and then he developed a field of psychology. So I'm curious about how he is seen academically when I hadn't looked at him that way. And to me, he's he developed a field of psychology, which is to be used and applied clinically, but there's so much more to Jung than that. Yeah. And that is throughout your books, throughout your writing. So how do you, how do you um, see his psychology being, do you, do you see it as part of his work? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a good. It, it, it's a good question. Um, I, I think I'd reply to it in in, in two ways, and I kind of explain what I mean by by, by academic, because he's he's not an, an academic thinker in the negative sense that he's he's he's, he's overly technical. He's he's trawling through all the vast secondary literature and 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 so on. But I mean, he's academic in the sense that um, he has an extraordinary mastery of knowledge of of Western and indeed non Western cultures yeah. as as well. Certainly, as far as German literature, German thought is is, is concerned, um, he's a very subtle reader of of thinkers, writers like Goethe uh, and Schiller uh, and, and and Nietzsche. Um, and I'd say that the twenty volumes of the collected works are, in many ways, there. It's, it's a little education in itself. In fact, mm. it's a big edu it's a big education. It's a big education in itself. And one of the things that I would say that I'm I'm grateful to to Jung for is is that I've I've learned an awful lot from him. He, he, it's simply the fact he has taught yeah. me an awful lot, and and I think other people who are agreeing with me, I think other people would say that they've got that experience as, as well. But but he's not someone who um, fits into the model of um, academic thinker as a kind of as a kind of gatekeeper. I mean, mm. he he's about opening up areas rather than mm -hmm. closing them down, rather than saying, well, you know, this is my specialism, and you can't talk about it because you're not a specialist, and so on. He's a far more generous and opener kind of thinker than uh, than that, and I think in one crucial respect, he's different from the the dominant outlook that we find in the arts and humanities at the moment, and and we could we could summarize that in 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 terms of postmodernity. The postmodernity is all about rupture. Uh, discontinuity, um, uh, friction, things which don't match up, um, uh, ultimately a kind of nihilism, a kind of interpretative despair. We can't understand what texts mean and, and so on. And Jung, by his temper and his practice, is exactly the opposite. He's all about continuity. He's all about making links. He's all about, mm. yes, we can understand the past and, and moreover, we can have a, we can discover a relevance in it, it to us. That sits very differently from the, from the kind of hermeneutic nihilism, which I think one finds, not always, but, but, but is very often the kind of basic ground music that's there in, in the arts and humanities. And we don't find that with, with Jung. I find that makes him very refreshing. I think other people find that makes him a little bit frightening and intimidating. Mm. Oh, yeah. So it's, um, as, as I was hearing you say that, what came to me is 
my stance in general about Jung and about, well, not about Jung, but about other fields and the some some other fields that I'm involved in. Let's just say that they're not taking into consideration psychology. They're not taking into consideration human psychology, the reality of the psyche, which is what Jung does. So when you were talking about postmodernism and I thought about, well, who's considering psychology? It's because we know so little about the human psyche. And that to me is the value of Jung. And I, I've mentioned this on the podcast many times. I have a long history in the field of psychology going back to high school and college. And Jung's psychology makes the most sense to me. And I've seen in all the years doing this podcast, I've seen the, how the listeners and people on social media respond to Jung's basic premises yeah. and, and, and how affected people yeah. are by it. Yeah. 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 So it, you, as a professor, do you teach Jung? Well, there's been there's been a shift um, within um, the terms of what we what we do is is increasingly with a focus on on, on language mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and on language instruction. Um, uh, and I have taught Jung. Um, I, I do try to um, slip him in um, whenever I'm whenever That's I'm given the the, the the opportunity. Um, and in fact, one. One of my books that you that you mentioned, the um, answer to Job, a, a commentary, arose out of a, a, a honors option class that I did on on, on Freud and Jung, um, where we were looking at religion, and so we looked at uh, at, at Freud on religion, and 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 then we looked at at, at Jung. Uh, this was in pre Red Book days, um, right. and and answer to Job. Um, seemed like the appropriate uh, the appropriate text to uh, text to look at, um, and of course one of the great things about 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 teaching a text is is that it really does force you to to, to go and, and look at it, and to mm. ask yourself how the hell do I explain this to people? Mm. What on earth is 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 going on here? Um, and and I remember trying to figure out you know how does one introduce this. It, it's actually a, it, it's a beautiful book. Answer to Job is, is a beautiful book. One might say it's it, it's Jung's best book, um, uh, but it's also very difficult as a point of entry, uh, partly yeah. because he's referencing so many things um, in in the sphere of religion, which aren't simply known about today as a common knowledge. So so you have a bit of work to do to do there, uh, but also the structure of the book as, as as well. I think people can find confusing, and I remember I just made a photocopy of the of, of the text. And put the pages around me, and started to to cut it up, and 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 reorganize it in in, uh -huh. in the chronology of the salvation history that's mm. that's there. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 doing that, I think, was well. You know, I think Jung would be sympathetic because you know I should have been down on the seashore, sort of playing with stones and making buildings with altars and and so on. But it it, it was a way of literally getting my hands on the on the text, and and discovering its structure. Um, the, the underlying um, components um, of of this this beautiful commentary that he does on on a biblical book, which is which was challenging then, challenging now, it, it, it's a fantastic text. And I would say that that's a good example of where I found teaching Jung has has it's taught me a lot. I hope mm -hmm. it's taught people who've been in the class a lot as well. So. I've heard you uh, give several talks and they're available on YouTube and I will provide links in the, in the description and you make these really beautiful, insightful connections reg in regard to Jung. And you, obviously you, you teach Goethe and you've written about Goethe and you make this connection between Goethe's Faust and Answer to Job. So I think the listeners would be interested in that. Would you say a little bit about that? Yeah, that, sure. Um, I, I mean, Goethe's Faust is kind of, you know, the, the basic key, as as um, I would see it, to, uh, to understanding uh, Germanistic. Um, and, and even if Goethe is now um, more seen as a problematic thinker, I mean, you know, dead white male kind of thing, um, that doesn't matter. It's not, it's, it's not, not a question of, of his status in that sense, but, but 
so many German writers after Goethe either take him as a model or take him as a target that they're going to be they're going to be arguing uh. against him in some way. So so he does have that kind of Schlüsselfunktion, you might say, you know, this key function um, of, of orientating people within uh, uh, within German culture. And of course, Goethe's Faust was, you know, the book which everybody which, which everybody knew and everybody read and everybody quoted from it. It's it's a bit like quotations from the King James Bible, which into mm. the, the English language, there's a kind of proverbial status that's uh, that's accrued to to many of the lines in in, in Faust. Uh, I wonder if that actual that function is in fact starting to starting to disappear because um, mm. I was talking about uh, uh, Goethe's Faust at a at a young conference in in Germany of all places and mm. somebody came up afterwards and said uh, well I was very interested could you tell me a bit more because I've never read Goethe's Faust mm. said, my goodness this is in Germany so we've, mm. we've got a piece, we've got a piece of work here we can't assume that people that people know these things and I think that's where we at really in our kind of cultural moment is we can't assume that people that people know these things and that's not to be critical of them it's not mm -hmm. about sort of waving a finger or sure. you know, lamenting ignorance and, and so on. it's simply the the, the hermeneutic moment that we're uh, that we're at and i think that that jung is a fantastic way of getting into uh at goethe's faust um it's it's clearly a work that was highly influential on on jung so many quotations, so many uh, allusions. I, I tried to track them in that uh, two-volume series on um, uh, analytical psychology and German classical aesthetics. It, it, there's so much material that, that's there. And, of course, this wonderful legend that, uh, that Jung puts out about the, the illegitimate son of, uh, uh, son of Goethe. And I think that shows two things about Jung. I think it's a symbolic way of him embedding himself in the German tradition and saying, well, I'm related to these guys. Um, this is this is part of my intellectual heritage. This is where I'm coming from. Um, but he's also doing it with a kind of sense of humor as well, because he's the bastard child of, uh, of, of Goethe. It's not a simple assuming a heritage. He's saying I'm part of it, but I'm also a little bit different. Right. Let's for some of the listeners who might not be aware of the the rumor, the legend. So it the way it goes is that Jung's grandfather claims I don't it did it come from him that he is the great grandfather. Yes, his yeah. Jung's great grandfather? Yeah. But the story isn't true, so I mean it doesn't matter. I thought it was Jung's grandfather that claimed that he is okay. the illegitimate son oh, right. okay. right. of yes. Goethe. Fine, yes. And so Goethe would be the great grandfather. That's right. Yeah. And you're so you're saying that that's been proven untrue? Well, it's very hard to prove it untrue, but it's very hard to prove it true. Because it could be true. And it seems like it is. So why why does it Jung had a connection when he read Faust at a young he read it at a young age, right? Well, no, that that's absolutely right, and 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 for me, I think that that's the key thing. Um, uh, maybe one day, one will be able to do a kind of um, I don't know genetic genetic test and, mm. uh, and 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 see whether it's uh, see whether it's it's absolutely true. Um, but I think I think that Jung tells the story with um, a, a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a twinkle in the eye, um, and, and that partly because he keeps on saying there's this very annoying legend which I wish people wouldn't talk about. And by the way, this is the legend. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is his shtick. This is his. This is his. This is his. This is his, this is his routine. Yeah. Um, and and I think rather than wondering about what well, actually is that true, it's what is that? What is that routine trying to trying to say? And I I, I think it's a way of of him referencing uh, what you're absolutely right to say is this this um, profound influence, this profound sense of a resonance uh, uh, that he finds at a very early age when he he, he reads uh, uh, Faust. At home, it's suggested to him by his mother. Um, uh, oh, we should go read Faust uh, uh, one of these one of these days. Um, and of course, you know, in an era without sort of uh, DVD or streaming, you know, he could go off and do that. So mm -hmm. he sits down and and and, and reads Goethe's uh, Goethe's Faust, um, and is fascinated, I think, by by two things which are kind of key er key symbols for for key areas of of later aspects of his thought: uh, the figure of Mephisto. The, the the devil, uh, this um, uh, figure of of negation of of um, 
and and the whole peculiar salvation history because as as Jung realizes you know in a way why should Faust be saved that's the kind mm. of thing that Gerd is doing there and then the second figures second set of figures would be would be that of the mothers mm. uh, these uh, mysterious what are they I don't know um, goddesses um, shadow types they're they're, they're called um, uh, that are there in part two of uh, of, of Goethe's Faust. Um, and of course, Jung's whole interest in the feminine, the eternal feminine, um, this figure that uh, that comes along at the at, at the end of part uh, at the end of part two, um, is is clearly something which uh, which fascinates Jung and it is at the heart of his uh, at the heart of his psychology as well. And and the good news is, well, possibly bad news, is I am tr working on working on a, a series of books that are going to come out with Chiron. Uh, that that look at these key texts for Jung. So there's going to be one on um, Wolfram's Parzifal, um, which ah. will be coming out this year. Oh, great! Um, there is um, the second one is actually going to be is going to be Goethe's Faust. So uh, kind of can put a little plug in uh, for that. Um, and then I want to uh, look at Nietzsche's Zarathustra, and um, and then we'll look at the Red Book as as the kind of final capstone to it uh, to it there. Oh, and we look forward to those. Well, yes. thank you. I mean, I'm 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 really enjoying uh, uh, writing them. I'm uh, very very pleased that uh, that Chiron are, are, are supportive of this uh, of, of this project. Yeah. Um, and of course, what I'm trying to do is to rather than saying, well, what a shame that people don't read Parsifal. What a shame that people don't read Faust. What a shame that people don't read Nietzsche. Is to say these texts are amazing. They are fantastic. Um, and if you're Jungian or Jungian in your approach to it, mm -hmm. you can get so much more from them and understand Jung so much better as, uh, as, better yes. as well. So I really hope it will encourage people to go back and, okay, read the entirety of Goethe's Faust. It's a major undertaking, but boy, is it worthwhile. Mm. About 10 years ago, before I started this podcast, uh, we were in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and there's an opera house there. They have an opera in the summer and they did a production of Faust. Wow. So we saw the opera yeah. And, yeah. and I was only interested because of my interest in Jung. So yeah, that was. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, another good, it's a good example of the way that, that, that Jung is a, a point of entry mm. into these, these fascinating areas of, uh, of, of, of German culture. Um, and of course, another figure who was who was equally interested in uh, in Goethe, albeit from a very different angle, of course, is Rudolf Steiner. Mm. Um, uh, and I, as I understand it, the the Goetheanum, this very strange uh, uh, building in Dornach in Switzerland. I don't know if you've ever been there, Laura, to uh, to Dornach, but it's the it, it's the no. center of it's the center of uh, of, of, Steiner, of Steiner studies and the the anthroposophical ah. world uh, worldview. Quite an amazing place because all of the houses have that kind of strange design which is um uh, typically anthroposophical typical Ste steinerian he has a very very um uh, how should i say characteristic uh, style of style of architecture and it's only i think at the Goetheanum uh, that they've put on Faust in its entirety on a, mm. on a regular basis. There, there was a version put on in Germany in the year 2000 which was a big Goethe anniversary um but that, that was a kind of a one off but but the Steinerians I understand do it quite do it quite regularly um and the whole question of the relation between Jung and Steiner is something which I'm very interested in as well um of course if Jung is unpopular in academic circles Rudolf Steiner even more so yeah and and I think some Jungian analysts aren't particularly keen on him as well either it's a shame because I think there's a great dialogue which could take place there it's a difficult dialogue to get going though I think yeah yeah so as I mentioned in the introduction, you were the Zurich lecturer at ISAP Zurich. I don't know if that was done remotely because it was during the pandemic. It was a long time before the pandemic. It was a long time before we even knew that they were uh, that there were pandemics. It must have been about um, oh, was it or ten years? Yes. Um, okay, because they published that. Uh, so I, the Zurich lectures were based on your book, Reading Goethe at Midlife. But that was originally published by Spring in 2011, and then it was republished by Chiron in 2020, right? That's exactly it. That's exactly right. So it would have been 2009, I think 2010, that um, that I did the, uh, uh, the, the Zurich lectures. 
Um, ah, and then they didn't publish it till 2020. And then it was published in 2011. And then um, because Spring Books has had its um, has has passed its catalog on um, to, oh, okay. to other places, right. and Tyron wanted to take on the uh, the um, Zurich Lecture Series, that's why there was a second edition that, uh, that, oh, that came okay. I, was, I was able to put a, a, a forward in, uh, in in front of it. But I'd cite the Zurich Lectures as a as a very good example of uh of how um jungian uh, jungianism um has enabled her to be work on on goethe that one wouldn't be able to do elsewhere mm. apart from of course murray stein um whose uh, a, a kind initiative it was to uh, to do that st still very grateful to, uh, to to murray for that and, uh, and and many other invitations um but the opportunity to speak in i think it was about three four lectures about a tip about a topic goethe related looking in particular at uh, goethe's late poem um, primal words orphic uavote offish with that kind of depth with, with that kind of stage time you'll never find that in the arts and humanities I mean, mm. it, it really was a precious gift to be able to take this topic of um, midlife crisis you know one of the one of the key ideas um, that uh, that Jung is that Jung is not known for, if, you know, more generally, um, and I wanted to try and relate that because that idea comes out of Goethe. I mean, if, if you read Goethe's uh, conversations with with Eckermann, he comes up with this idea. He says that halfway through life, he says, one hits this crisis. He, he has a, Goethe has a terrifying phrase. He says, "Der Mensch muss ruiniert werden." Says that the human being has to be ruined. They have to be destroyed. They have to they have to fall apart, be pulled apart. Kind of Dionysian um, uh, dissipation of the of the self, in order then to recuperate and to reorganize and restructure. And of course, that's the pattern of that's the pattern of the uh, of the, of the midlife and the midlife crisis. Yeah. Um, uh, so I was very glad to have the opportunity to to look at this idea. Of, of midlife crisis. I remember that I had a little bit of research time um, and I was based in London and was able to go to the British Library and order up as many books as I could find on midlife crisis. Mm. I think they were a bit worried about me as I came in and yeah. got <laughs> back with 20 books. <laughs> right. <and> that, right? <laughs> sure. But but it is a fascinating topic. It is a mm. fascinating idea. Jung's contribution, Jung's not the only theoretician of midlife crisis, but um, he's, he's obviously one of the major ones. Um, it draws directly out of what uh, Goethe says to says to Eckermann, and my my thesis was that um, this great poem Urwarte Offish can be can be read as containing within it this central idea of crisis and resolution, which is so typically Jungian. And yeah. it was a fantastic opportunity to pursue that thesis and and to be able to take people through it and share this great poem. It really is. It's it's one of Goethe's greatest poems. One of his greatest poems, and. Absolutely. Would you, would you spell that? I'm, I'd like to add that to the show notes, and I don't even know where to begin. Well, that I tell you, what, I'll, I'll zip it to you on, a, in, on on an email. But but urvarte, okay. so primal word U R W O R T E, urvarte, okay, primal word, offish O R P H I S C H. So primal words. Orphic. It's it's a very strange, very strange title because you know you've got you've got a noun and an adjective and they're separated by a by a by, by a full stop. Uh, but it's got this key this key uh, element in it here of where, whenever the Germans put the preface you are in front of something ur, it makes it terribly old. So you can old. have ur ide or ur uh. bild. Remember the primordial image, which is what Jung mm. used to call the archetype. Yeah, that's that's an ur bild. Um, and so the idea of an urwart is, is a primal word, and its 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 intellectual historical context is the debate about myth uh, that was going on um, in, uh, in in Goethe's lifetime in the in, in the eighteenth century. How do we understand myths? Um, are we are we to take them as something which is um, a source of revelation, or are we to see them as something which is essentially, essentially fictional? You know, same kind of you know debate that goes on about myth today. How do, how do we categorize it? And out of this debate, um, Goethe synthesizes um, this this wonderful little small epic poem um, in about five or six stanzas, which which narrate the life of of an individual. Um, and so that's what you get in reading Goethe at Midlife in the second part is, is trying to tease out 
um, through a form of you know close reading of that of that particular poem, uh, what it is that uh, that that binds Jung and Goethe in respect of this idea of midlife crisis, mm -hmm. where the emphasis is not simply on crisis, but on overcoming it, on resolving it, of emerging stronger for it, and and again that's something which is you know not exactly flavor of the month. Rather, everybody much prefers Lacanian despair. Oh, not over here. Uh, yeah, yeah but that, yeah, that that goes back to what we were t discussing in the beginning about Jung not being very popular, and it. I, you know, I've he heard you mention that in other talks, and my what i've experienced is that people think they're interested in jung and they think they know what jung's about and they'll mention one or two things instead of his decades long body of work and then when they're presented with more of what jung wrote about and came up with they don't want to hear it they don't want to know they're not interested but it applies to everybody Oh, well, I think I think that's right, and of course, you know, Jung himself is meant to have said, "Thank goodness I'm not a Jungian," you know. So um, I, I, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. Um, and on the other hand, clearly, Jung does have a a massive theoretical legacy. Um, there are various schools, um, you know, emerging from him. I think Andrew Samuels has this typology where he comes up with about three or four different. Um, lines of filiation um, in, in the way that uh, that Jung's ideas are are, are taken forward. Um, I think one of the big pity is is that um, when it comes to reading liter literary texts, um, somehow the the kind of hunting for archetypes approach is mm, is is right. I think over associated with Jung. So yeah, you look there and oh, there's an archetype, there's an archetype. End of story, and we can Ridiculous. go Ridiculous. Yeah, it is. I think. Well, it yeah. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't do anything for me, and I think it, I think it's very reductive, and I think and yeah. it misses it misses the richness of 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 Jung's style of reading, where he's far more interested. I would I would say it in in structure, pattern, development, symbol, uh, obviously, um, and of course the classic example of that are those those uh, those two volumes of uh, commentary on Thus Spake Zarathustra. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough to, that they came out just at the time when, when I was doing the thesis. Um, I was very, very lucky about that because um, when I started to put the proposal in, I didn't know they were going to be published. And then, lo and behold, they uh, they were. Um, and I think they're a classic piece of of of, of Jung, Jung's work. Um, it's very it's very idiosyncratic. Um, it is, of course, partly you know that arises out of it, it's a light, it's a seminar which is holding. So mm -hmm. he's partly responding to questions, going with the flow of the audience, and 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 so on and so forth. But there are also, I think, moments of of, of profound insight. Um, and and it's it's it, I think one of the great commentaries on on Zarathustra that's there, fully the equal of those by by Leo Strauss and other commentators who've come forward in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And for the listeners who might be interested, did you write, I, I listed some of your books, I have every single book I could find that you have either written or edited, I already have in the show notes for this episode. And I, I'm instead of me scrolling through it now, would you remind me? What have you written on on Jung's uh, seminars on Zarathustra? Right. Well, that that takes the form of um, a couple of chapters in the Dionysian self. Well, I I will provide a link. I have it to the public to the book on the publisher's website. It is Walter de Groiter. That's it. And it was published in 1995. Again, That's it is the Dionysian self. Yeah. So, I'd but, like go ahead. Point, just mm -hmm. just. To, Quickly come in on that and, yeah. and say, I did revisit the whole question of of Jung and Nietzsche in a in a different way from a different angle, um, in uh, a more recently published book which was uh, published by by Routledge um, on the blissful islands yes. in the shadow of the Superman, in Nietzsche and Jung, and if the greater one is too much, then then maybe maybe give a punt to 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 this one on the blissful islands. Because it, it is all about Goethe and Nietzsche, but done in a very different way from, from what I was doing in the in, in in the Dionysian self. That that was an academic thesis that was approached from the perspective of um, you know 
kind of pure intellectual history. And what I wanted to do in On the Blissful Islands was um, reflect more on some of the images and, and symbols, and in particular on the idea of, of self-sculpting, um, which mm-hmm. arises out of a passage of, a beautiful passage in, uh, in, Nietzsche's, in Nietzsche's Zarathustra. And I try and trace that through some of the, some of the Jungian aspects, some of the Neoplatonic aspects, some of the Schillerian aspects. Um, and so on the Blissful Islands, I think will probably be a lot cheaper. I don't know if you can give us a price for that, Laura. I don't yes, know. I, I, I will. And I just would like to mention that the subtitle is In the Shadow of the Superman. Yeah, I yeah, I love that. So on Amazon US right now, well, it is more affordable, but it's still a little up there. The paperback edition is $45.56. The hardcover is $106, but there is a Kindle edition that varies. Um, hmm. Looks like you can rent it for $27.41, or you can purchase it for $42.71. So I didn't, I didn't know you could rent Kindle books. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't I, mean, I don't know what the time limit is. I yeah. haven't done that in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, there are also, there's also eight books and secondhand copies. Um, I, 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 as I look around my library, I think probably most of the, uh, well, not most, but a good number of books I have are, 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 are secondhand books. Um, but of course, you know, we used to have secondhand bookshops, you know, I know to, I was just going to say that <laughs> you used to go to London and, and, and there'd be, there'd be, um, you know, uh, several of them I'd, I'd, I'd regularly visit and, you know, you'd be able to pick up an academic paperback for uh, five pounds, probably 10 pounds. You'd probably think was probably quite expensive then that probably is, um, that's quite cheap now. Uh, but now everything's gone online and I think that's driven prices of books, um, yeah. uh, upward, uh, but AB books might be, might be worth, um, uh, uh, having a go um and of course there's always you could read samples on on google books um i mean that's that's quite a useful way of giving you a sense of whether you really want to uh, uh to um fork out for the book or, yeah. or not but, but sometimes I, i'm bound to say i've got a i've got to support routledge um and, and chiron because i think you know without them we might not have the books available at all i agree I agree. Absolutely. Uh, With Google Books, I've noticed that a lot of times they don't have a preview available. Uh, Amazon seems to have gotten rid of their book previews. Um, But going back to the secondhand bookstores, are the ones that you used to frequent, are they all closed now? They are, yeah, because are. you know, because people have people have moved their um, uh, moved their purchases on on online, and I think it's a big question as to you know what's happening with independent bookstores as uh, as, as well. Um, you know, um, Glasgow used to have we used to have a great big Borders bookshop that yeah. that's closed. Um, there was a John Smith's was a, a great Glasgow publisher and bookseller. That's almost entirely disappeared. They've got a few little outlets um, at the at, at, at the universities. Um, and I think this is an area where um, people have shifted their their, their purchasing um, on online. Um, it's, it's a shame because you lose you lose the bookshop. But 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 equally for someone such as myself, you know, ordering books from Germany used to be such a palaver. You, you know, there were very few booksellers who would do that. Um, you'd, you'd have to do it over. I can't remember the name of the bookshop in London that would that would do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly, I'd say that the uh, that the internet, by allowing you to to um, buy books from German Amazon, has made it a lot easier to to, to get hold of German paperbacks than it was in the past. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that there were bookshops, great bookshops in in Berlin. They're all closed down because people do it on uh, people do it online. So, the, what we need to ask ourselves is: is is it because people are buying the books elsewhere, or is it they've just stopped buying them, or is it even worse they've stopped reading? Um, mm. That's what worries me: is 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 the decline in reading, the decline of a of, of a reading culture. And I think Jung could help kind of kickstart that as well because. When I'm reading Jung and I look at the footnotes and I see something, I think, look, I really want to go and check out that reference. Um, and I think he's a good way of, of getting back into, um, you know, nonstop reading, nonstop learning. He's, um, it, as I say, really a kind of education in himself. I want to take this time to mention something that I read in your most recent book, Reading Plato Through Jung, Why Must the Third Become the Fourth, which I want to get to. Uh, and maybe we should get to it now because it's reminding me of this wonderful quote that you 
mention um, that had totally passed me by by Professor Sonu Shamdasani, who was my guest in episode 75. And most people know the name, but for those who don't, he edited Jung's Red Book and Jung's Black Books, and he's written a number of other books. And he is a professor at University College London. You say that he has argued that Jung derived his idea about the collective unconscious from his library going so far as to describe the collective unconscious as quote, the library within. Thank I love much. that. And I actually mm -hmm. tweeted that yesterday and it, it got a, a fairly large response. Would you say yeah. a little bit more about that? And where is that quote from? Yeah, um, I I think that is from uh, uh, Sonu's book, uh, which is a very good book on, uh, on, on Jung's library. Um, uh, it's it, it, it's a wonderful book. It's got lots of pictures, illustrations of um, the editions that Jung uh, that, that Jung had, um, and I think in it, um, I, I think I think Sonu is kind of being um, and justifiably, or, you know, a little polemical there, um, because what he's trying to say is, um, you know, where does the collective unconscious come from? You know, or where is it? Where is it located? Um, is it somewhere deep in the psyche? Um, that's one way of thinking about it. Is it? Is it? And I think this is the kind of interpretation that um, that I would be comfortable with. Is it? It's a way of talking about our, our shared um, collective culture, um, and it's unconscious because it's there, but we don't not we do not know it's there, um, and we have to learn and 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 discover it. Um, and I think that's the sense that I would that I would take this. And, and and that I would take, you know, volume 20 of the collected works, you know, this great index of mm. all the various names and people and, uh, and, and texts and, and say, um, sure, you can have the collective unconscious as a kind of mystical concept. But I think you can also see it as something which is more akin to what the Kantian philosopher, neo-Kantian philosopher Ernst Cassira in his in his philosophy of symbolic forms, what, what he's trying to get at which is that there is a, a symbolic content to the way that we think as, as, cultured, as cultured individuals. That is to say that you know, we, are, we are cultured individuals make it sound elitist. I don't mean it in that sense. Okay. I mean that to be, a, to be an individual, you have to be able to assume a certain level of, of, of culture. You have to be able to relate yourself uh, to the past. Uh, you have to know about the past. You have to be able to relate it to the present, and you have to see what your own contribution is going to be to it in those uh, in in those terms as as well. And that's why this concept of of, of Kultur uh, is is so important for the Germans, um, certainly for those in the tradition around Ernst Cassirer. Uh, but I think it's also very important for uh, for Jung as for Jung as well. And of course, there is this little passage in in, in memories, dream, dreams, reflections, mm -hmm. um, uh, where where Jung uh, makes this point, and it's in relation to what we were talking about earlier, the figure of Faust. Mm -hmm. And in memories, dreams, reflections, uh, Jung is recorded as saying, "Later, I consciously linked my work to what Faust had passed over: respect for the eternal rights of humankind." recognition of the ancient and the continuity of culture and intellectual history mm. and and i think that's a for me that's a beautiful summary of what jung is he he's also mm. a psychologist he's also a psychoanalyst but he's also a cultural uh, historian but he's someone who brings those two things together because these things matter to us now and recognition of the ancient continuity of culture, eternal rights of humankind. I think that's a beautiful statement of what Jungian psychology can be. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. So in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to another topic here, which is the Eranos conference that was held in 2022, which was supposed to be held in 2020 but got postponed twice due to the pandemic and you presented there uh remotely but your talk is available on the Aranos Foundation's YouTube channel and in that uh the the talk that you presented was published in volume five of Jung's Red Book for Our Time and what did I want to say here uh 
I mean, we could get into the Red Book. There's so many different things I, I could talk to you about, but in the interest of time, uh, I wanted to ask you about this, or I wanted to, to bring this up. Uh, you knew the late Jungian analyst, Anthony Storr. Mm. Yes. Uh, was he a, a friend of yours, a, a mentor? He, he was a kind of mentor. Um, he, he was... Um... Uh, someone to whom my uh, doctoral supervisor, Richard Shepard, who, who um, uh, sadly died last year and who, who supervised oh. my, my, my thesis on, uh, on, on, on Nietzsche and Jung. Um, and, uh, and Richard was a very, very good supervisor. Um, he, 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 to the extent that I can write, um, he, he taught me how to write, taught me how to, to think and, uh, and, and, and argue. Mm. Um, so I learned a lot from him and, and, and other teachers as I've uh, gone through my life as, uh, as, as, as well. And, um, and I think he knew that Anthony Storr was, I think it was Wolfson College, was he was, he was a fellow, and he had the right, uh, he had the right idea, you know, I should be in contact with, with someone like Anthony Storr as a, as, as a Jungian, and um, he, he very kindly set up um, at lunch for me to meet, uh, uh, meet Anthony, and Anthony was uh, very helpful, very supportive in, um, in being a referee for me um, when I was putting in for, uh, for job applications, and um, oh. Um, you know, it's 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 tough now um, beyond belief for academic jobs, but it, it wasn't the easiest of things then. And um, Anthony Storr was very very patient in um, writing letters in support of my uh, my applications. And um, I met him on a couple of times and discussed my work. And uh, it, it, it wasn't a close contact, but I would say I'm profoundly grateful that he even bothered to take the time that he did to deal with a postgraduate working on Nietzsche and Jung of all topics. Is, is it difficult? You mentioned that it was difficult. The well, well, absolutely, and 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 I think even more difficult now um, because because Jung, Jung isn't flavor of the month, um, and um, uh, it, it's happened to me on several occasions with with job applications that that um, somebody says, well, but 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 why are you working on Jung if he's a Nazi? And, oh and, and, and no, are, well, yeah, but you know, fact is, I don't think he was. Um, doesn't really get your interview, academic interview, off to the right kind of tone, does it? Really, um, and, and, and I. That think seems that to be. I just want to interrupt you. That seems to be the go-to accusation when somebody wants to ruin somebody's reputation. Yeah, no, I, I mean it's absolutely right, and uh, it, 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 it's even more of an accusation with uh, uh, Ludwig Clarkers. Um, oh. it, you know, it, you, you're quite right when you said I, uh, I support the underdog because um, I mean they're not the underdogs really. I think they're the great thinkers of the uh, of, of the 20th century. Um, uh, but you're not allowed to say that. Uh, but I genuinely find I learned a lot from Jung, um, even yeah. if I take issue with various things. I've genuinely learned a lot from from Ludwig Klagers, and um, want to share that with uh, with people. And I think we've got to somehow move the conversation into in, into a different gear than mm. that rather than a, attacking the individual um, and, um, and, and and criticizing them for whatever views they might or might not have had. Um, uh, it's it's it, it's a tremendously reductive uh, uh, negation, and it simply ignores the fact that we have the twenty volumes with uh, uh, with Jung, um, uh, the incredible complex prose that that Ludwig Clark has write. I think these people deserve a better a better reception. I'm I'm really glad to hear you say that, and thank you for the work that you do. And I want to mention why I brought up Anthony Storr. Uh, it's because in your Aranos talk, I, I have to read the note here, uh, you mentioned that you knew him and you mentioned this quote in the conclusion to your book. That's where I saw it. Jung's answer to Job, a commentary, which you dedicated to, to Anthony Storr. Uh, you mentioned his account of a meeting with Jung. And he said, with lowered voice and very serious mean, he lent, he, he would sound better in your voice. He leant toward me and said, you know, with dreams, there is always a chance of the Eucharist mm -hmm. every night. Yeah. And that gave me chills and it still does. Yes. And I'd like for you to say a few words about that, if you would. Yes, gives gives me the chills. I mean, keeps me awake at night. I think almost mm. thinking about that. Not no 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 not going to get a wink of sleep now. Uh, <laughs> you've uh, you've uh, yeah, you've mentioned that. Um, 
well, there's so much that one could one could uh, say about it, but just you know, sticking to the surface of it and, and so on. What I would say about that passage, um, and of course, we're relying on Anthony Storr to have accurately represented it, but but I'm, I'm sure that Anthony would have uh, would have yeah. done that. I think that for me, one of the things that it shows was what a great performer Jung was. Um, uh, what a talented individual in terms of, you know, really being able to spook other people or, um, uh, you know, forcing them to, to, to reappraise their, uh, their approach, their approach to things. Mm. And this whole idea of him sort of leaning across and, 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 and making this, um, awesome, literally awesome, uh, kind of statement to Jung, uh, the, the statement to Anthony Storr seems to me to be a good example of, of, of how shrewd, Jung was in presenting himself and presenting ideas and 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 and, and interacting with people, and of course it, there's so much that, that could be said about that in terms of you know this is a, a Eucharist which would individually uh, be delivered. It's a Eucharist which is not provided or mediated by by the church. Uh, for me, the whole idea of a kind of private Eucharist is that it seems to me we're far more in the territory of the Grail. Mm-hmm. And the whole legend of the Holy Grail, um, and which which is another great German theme, uh, another great European theme, as far as uh, as, as far as Jung is uh, is concerned. Um, and I think that if if um, if Jung meant it with a slightly ironic tone, that that's not to downplay the significance, because 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 irony is is an enrichment of discourse rather rather than and an impoverishment. And I think that there is a certain um, kind of uh, exaggerated sense of drama about that, but also a, a a subtle truth that's in there as as well, which is that the individual in, in, in engaging with ourselves and with that other part of ourselves, which is which is which is the dream world, we do find a a redemption of sorts. Um, and I think it's a beautiful example of how Jung is very often communicating in a kind of quasi ironic, quasi symbolic quasi-serious, quasi-existential mode, what a performer. I, I think I just, I take, take my hat off to Jung all the time. I would like to close with a little bit about your latest book, Reading Plato Through Jung, because you in it, you point out the complex relation between the two, between Plato and Jung. And its subtitle is Why Does the Third Become the Fourth? And you call it Jung's obsession with the third and the fourth. And the book is in four parts. Um, the introduction is psychoanalysis and the problem of the third and the fourth. Then there's Jung's reading of Plato and the Timaeus. Then Jung on the doctrine of the Trinity. And the fourth part is the Timaeus and cosmology, the third and the fourth in alchemy and synchronicity. It really is a fantastic book. It's less than 200 pages. And I'm going to let you talk now. Yeah, no, well, well, thank you very much for, for that. It's, uh, it, it, it's a book which, which came about. It was originally going to be an article. Yeah. And, and yeah, and it kind of grew and grew and grew. And um, uh, the, the uh, Journal of Analytical Psychology um, made the very wise suggestion where they said, this, look, actually, this isn't really an article. This is more a kind of a book length, mm-hmm. uh, book length thing. Um, and um, it was written during lockdown. And um, I discovered that there is this, this format by Paul Gray Macmillan called Pivot, uh, where they, they say publish research at its natural length and so on. And this seemed to fit wonderfully into the kind of 50, 60,000 pages, uh, 50, 60,000 words that, that the Paul Gray Pivot <laughs> consists of. Um, you could write 6,000 pages about, about these topics. But yes. what I wanted to do was, was to deal with, I mean, I've asked myself this, why must the three become the four? I mean, Jung keeps going on about it. So yeah. it seemed to me it was a genuine question, okay? Um, and that when, when looking into it, it was it was a way of, of bringing together um, along the track of this, this, you know, very simple question, why must the three become the four? Um, many of the deep intellectual sources of, 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 of Jungian psychology, and you mentioned them there because they're there in the book title, um, uh, Plato, 
uh, in particular, the, the, the story of the creation of the world by the demiurge in, in the Timaeus. And this is a kind of running theme uh, throughout Jung. Um, we find it in the Black Books. We find it in um, Psychology of the Unconscious. Um, and uh, we find it emerging again in um, uh, Collected Works 11 when he's writing about uh, the theory of the, the, the doctrine of the, of the Trinity. Mm. Um, we have the doctrine of the Trinity, Jung's whole stance on, um, on, on Catholicism uh, and, and Catholic theology um, and in particular. Um, and it also brings in, of course, the figure of, of Goethe um, through the actual sort of source of this 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 idea of where does the three become the uh, how does the four the three become the four mm-hmm. emerges from uh, uh, Goethe's Faust uh, a little line in in this this wonderful scene um, uh, which is the the classical Walpurgisnacht um, in uh, in part two of in part two of Faust so it seemed to me that we had you know all all of the greatest hits were here we'd have Plato mm-hmm. and the Timaeus we'd have Goethe and Faust a little bit of alchemy synchronicity um, uh, uh, dawn um, thrown in there as as well um, and the conclusion I think is an attempt to uh, to try and bring this together in relation to the Jungian idea of totality because I yeah. think why the you know why must the three become the four is because the four is a kind of approximation or, or the starting point of total rotundity, complete totality, um, absolute circularity, the perfection of the self as the circle. And of course, remember that this is the great definition that Jung has of the self is a kind of circumambulation, a kind mm-hmm. of a kind, a kind of going round. Um, and so it was one of the things that kept me going during the very difficult time of lockdown was was um, working on this material, trying to hold it all together and actually then discovering that at the end, it's a very short book, but I hope one which has its its integrity, um, has its interest and will encourage people to look more into some of these sources like Dawn and Goethe and Plato's Timaeus as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, and there is a, a conclusion, the four parts and then a conclusion. And I love the conclusion. I was tweeting from it yesterday, and I'm going to continue to tweet from it because I think it, it's brilliant. I love this oh, book. Thank you. Oh, mm-hmm. well, thank you very much. It, it, it was a pleasure to write. And um, uh, I hope that people will find that it's uh, a, a useful way of constellating these various intellectual sources. It's not about pointing out, oh, Jung gets it from somewhere else. It's to show about how Jung is a great thinker for thinking onwards, mm. the materials that um, are part of our cultural uh, our cultural heritage. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Professor Bishop. And I'd like to invite you back when your books are published by Chiron so that we can continue this conversation and get into it in uh, a little bit more depth. Well, thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate it, uh, uh, Laura. It's been uh, a, a wonderful chance to uh, share some ideas with, with you. I'd be delighted to come back. And um, yep, Chiron, uh, I think we're working away and we're looking at getting volume one out in May, I believe. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, we look forward to seeing you back then. When the weather's a lot warmer. Yeah. Yes, for both of us. Yes. Please visit the website speakingofyoung.com for more information on everything discussed in this episode and to access all of our previous episodes available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Young is also available on YouTube podcasts, which you can access by subscribing to our channel, Jungian and Laura. It's free. Just click the subscribe button below. This podcast is made possible by the revolutionary new dream tracking app, Temenos Dream. Discover the hidden meaning of your dreams using symbolism, literature, and mythology. Use the built-in AI illustrator and dream interpreter and share your dreams with others, all within the app. Download it by clicking on the link on the episode page or in the description box below and set up a free account today and tell your friends about it too. I created Speaking of Jung over eight years ago as a free podcast. All of our content is still free to access, but it is not free to produce. Please visit the new support page on our website at speakingofyoung.com support to learn about the myriad ways you can now help keep this podcast going. And next month, we will be joining Patreon. So look forward to that as well. With my heartfelt thanks to all of our listeners and especially to our donors, I am Laura London, and you've been watching a very special video edition of Speaking of Young.